Okay. So we are uh, talking about resistance and in particular peripheral resistance, uh, which you can see uh, example of a model system of peripheral resistance. And uh, I guess just to sort of remind you, you should have in your notes our peripheral resistance equals 8 times B times L all over pi r to the fourth. So that's our model of peripheral resistance and we've gone through and defined viscosity and the length of the tube and then the diameter, I'm sorry, the radius of, of the tube. Uh, and we know the effects of adjusting each of these. And ultimately, radius, because of that fourth power, is going to be the biggest effector of length. And we finished up with vasoconstriction, vasodilation being the mechanisms to adjust the tube radius. So considering all of this, now let's look at the consequences on blood flow. Not inside of some model like we have here in this image, but specifically in a biological living vessel. So the, the flow of blood within a vessel is initially going to have some friction that gets induced to reduce the rate of flow or the flow rate and this is going to happen along the wall of the vessel. Another way to state this, that there's friction that's basically restricting flow rate along the wall, is that we are going to have a flow that is faster, or a faster flow rate that is toward the middle of the vessel. And so this would be away from the vessel wall. Okay, so if I were to kind of draw this out just a little bit, and here is our vessel, and just putting arrows in to, res to, to resemble rates of flow, the longer the arrow is, the faster the flow rate, the shorter the arrow is, the slower the flow rate, we would have shorter arrows here near the wall because the blood is actually going to be interacting with those cells that make up the wall that are going to actually have not a real smooth surface, but a um, sort of lumpy surface. And so the, the, the flow is actually much more turbulent. And so it, it, it forms sort of this turbulent layer where the, the flow is more like on the edge of a river, if that makes sense. It's not real straight. It's actually much more turbulent. And then as we move in towards the middle, these arrows get longer and longer. Okay, so we sort of have this kind of edge of flow where the middle is going to be the leading edge and then as we move closer and closer to the wall the rate becomes more and more turbulent and so rather than being really smooth towards the walls it's much more turbulent and there's a little less turbidity here on um, uh, the kind of next distance away from the vessel wall. Now the picture that I'm painting here is that the flow inside of the vessel becomes what's known as laminar. And you've maybe heard of laminate countertops. In fact, the desks that you're sitting at right now are laminate desks. And that's because they have a layer of that material that they've made look like wood. It's faux wood. And it's just been layered onto the tabletop. And so when I say flow is laminar, I'm saying that that flow becomes layered. You have this middle layer here that's quick and very smooth. And as we move away from there, it becomes much more turbulent until we have very turbid flow that reduces the, the frequency of flow or the rate of flow as we move toward, uh, closer and closer towards the wall. You okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
Okay, so what would be the effect of this on this laminar flow if we were to increase the radius? Already knowing that radius is very important when it comes to changing resistance. So if we increase the radius, what actually is happening, which you would know that this is going to lead towards what? Increase or decrease blood flow? Increase in blood flow. So the physiological reason is because we now have a reduction in the amount of blood that is in contact with the wall. So if we open this up, if we make this tube bigger, let me just kind of draw it down here and we'll draw it a little bit bigger. So here's our tube that's the same tube as uh, that we had previously, but now it's much larger. And so now the amount of blood that is in contact here against the wall that's very turbid as it flows is much less, a lower volume of blood. And that means there's more blood flowing further away from the walls of the vessel. And that's going to increase the rate of flow in each of these layers. And collectively, it is now increasing blood flow. Is this making some sense? So another way to put this, as we increase the radius, which causes a decrease of blood in contact with the wall, because the blood is now not as high of a volume in contact with the wall, we actually have a reduction in friction. If I can spell that right. Not fiction, but friction. That increases the flow. So if we drop friction because we've increased the radius, we now have a reduced peripheral resistance. That peripheral resistance, again, is what's holding back on the vessel and on the blood flow while push your pressure is pushing in the other direction. If I reduce that force back, drop it down, pressure stays the same, it increases the rate of flow. So that PR equals 8 times V times L over pi r to the fourth. Changing the radius, we can do that very simply with vasoconstrictors and vasodilators, chemicals that change vessel shape, and really explains why that R value has the highest or biggest influence on peripheral resistance. And that's why we put it to the fourth power in that model. So let's just step back now and take a look at blood flow by way of some summary. Okay, so just to summarize everything that we've talked about before we move on, blood flow is going to be measured in a unit of milliliters per minute. So it's a volume of liquid in a unit of time which makes blood flow a rate. Anyone remember, don't look back in your notes, anyone remember how we would model blood flow? Okay, so our change in pressure over, okay, and we're going to specifically call this peripheral resistance. Because that's really what we're dealing with. The resistance is a peripheral resistance. It's the resistance that we experience out here in the peripheral circulation. So I can take this really a step further, right? And I can take my equation for peripheral resistance. So I'm give that to me. PR equals VL over pi R to the fourth. And I could substitute that in here in my blood flow equation. Now, if we kind of go through and do all the algebra here, I know that you all love this. And we just simply kind of reorganize this and state this in a word problem rather than a mathematical equation. We say peripheral resistance is affected by three factors. So if you can remember those three factors, viscosity, length, and tube radius. 
you should always be able to take your peripheral resistance and map that out. Okay, so this is going to be substituted in up here. Okay, so we're going to put those three factors, we're going to take those three factors and actually let each have an, its own effect rather than just collectively referring to it as peripheral resistance. Remember, really, our change in pressure is the combination of pressure on one side versus pressure on the other side of the circuit that we're evaluating. So if I go through and I do that, and I'm just doing a simple algebraic substitution. So sub whoops. What is RP? Substitute. Substitute peripheral resistance into equation number one from above. Now I reorganize in my blood flow equation, again still in milliliters per minute, is now going to be my delta P, my change in pressure, all over 8V times L over pi R to the fourth. Now that's not very easy to use, so we can take this a step further, just do some algebraic simplification. And so if I simplify, Now my blood flow, still in milliliters per minute, we're just simply going to take the bottom here and we're going to put it up on top. So it's going to be delta P times pi R to the fourth all over 8 V times L. Yeah, that's a multiplication. Not a great symbol there. Multiply. That looks better. So this would be our simplified blood flow equation. And I could give you pressures and your radius and understanding that 8 VL are basically constants, you could go through and you could actually do some calculations on what your expected blood flow should be. Now, you'll remember back to the beginning of this lecture, um, just a couple of days ago, I had said that we needed to remember there's a difference between blood flow and tissue perfusion or perfusion, right? So blood flow, this is just a simple description of moving the fluid of blood from one location to another location. So it might be the blood flow from the aortic semilunar valve to the cup occlusion uh, on the brachial arteries. We might want to know what kind of blood flow we have there. And now we have a way where we can quantify that. And so that's just simply talking about the, the flow of blood from that point to that point. But in reality, the, the function of the circulatory system is going to be met in tissue perfusion. This is going to be summarized as capillary exchange. Okay, so this is now the idea of not just simply transporting from one point to another, but actually meeting the function of the circulatory system to move nutrients and oxygen into the tissue and to remove the waste products of carbon dioxide, the urea, nitrogen, and other nitrogenous waste back into the bloodstream to be circulated to tissues like the kidney and the liver for disposal. So capillary exchange. <coughs> 
It's sort of that next step of the circulatory system. Once we've moved blood from one location to another through blood flow, now we've got to perfuse the tissue. That's going to be done in the capillaries. That's why we refer to it as capillary exchange. And this exchange is a two-way movement of fluid. So two-way movement of fluid. And basically what I mean when I'm saying that is you have blood, and really it's mostly the extracellular fluid of blood, things like the plasma, crossing the capillary uh, capillaries into the extracellular matrix surrounding the tissue, and the extracellular fluid coming back out into the bloodstream. At any given time, about 5% of the total blood volume is involved in this process. About 5% of the total blood volume is involved in this capillary exchange. And we're actually going to have three routes of exchange, three ways in which this exchange can occur. And really, these three ways are associated and related to the three types of capillaries that we find in our circulatory system. The first way of exchange is to go directly through the endothelial cytoplasm. So in other words, as this blood passes through, we have mechanisms to pick up fluid and move it into the blood capillary cell itself and then to pass it off into the extracellular fluid surrounding the blood capillary. Okay? So we're going to move it through the cell, through the endothelial cell, through its cytoplasm. As you might imagine, that's what's going to happen in our continuous capillaries. The other way, or one of the other other ways, is to allow that fluid to filter through the intracellular clefts that we find between the endothelial cells that make up the capillary. Um, so you can see that in each of these pictures uh, very well here in the sinus. But there's small amounts of space in between each of these cells. And that small amount of space, it's not really, really tight junctions like we find in the rest of the tissue where there's not really any space. There's a little bit of space, and that allows filter uh, or uh, solution to filter through. And then finally, the third, you probably have already figured out the third. What would be the third? through the fensters or the fenstrations in our fenstered capillaries. Okay, so this is going to be fenstrations through the endothelial cells. Like what you can see here, you have those openings or pores, and they help to filter solution through. So those are the three different routes. Now we also have... <coughs> three mechanisms. So we have three mechanisms of movement. Now, these three mechanisms of, of movement don't get confused here. These don't line up just, okay, it's three routes, and then each route has its own mechanism. In fact, all three of these mechanisms will go through all three different routes. Okay? So it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. Through the epithelium, or the uh, endothelium, rather, we can have molecules diffuse. We can have molecules that get picked up by transcytosis, and we can have molecules that get pushed through through filtration or reabsorption. 
Okay, so let's start with diffusion. Now, already you should recognize diffusion. We've already talked about diffusion. It's coming back to Hawk now. Diffusion requires what? Yeah, what kind of gradient? Pressure gradient? Concentration gradient. Yeah. So the impetus to move when diffusion is being used is for the solute to travel down its concentration gradient. So the solute travels down its concentration gradient. And this is going to go through the endothelium, and it could go through the membrane. It could just simply diffuse through a channel into the cytoplasm, or it could go through the intracellular clefts, or it could go through the fence tips that are present, the fenestrations that are present on our capillaries. Now, when we go through the membranes, we actually have to couple this with an additional mechanism. If we go between the cells and through the fensters, this is just simply from plasma to the extracellular fluid. But if we go through the membrane, we're going from the plasma to the intracellular fluid of the cell, and then we have to go through a number, another membrane into the extracellular uh, matrix of the tissue. So in some cases, and again, this will happen in all three different types of cells, whether they're sinusoidal cells, continuous cells, or fenestrated cells. They are going to get, they are also all going to pick up, it's not exclusive is what I'm trying to say, that if it's fenestered, that we're just going to have diffusion through the fenster. We actually have some diffusion that occurs through the membrane of those cells. And then we got to couple that with transcytosis. That's not really a great, there we go, that looks better. Trans. Transcytosis. Transcytosis. Once we have material that's inside of the cell, transcytosis, just as its name sounds, it's going to transport it through the cell. So the material is moved through the cell. Now, in addition to single solutes diffusing into, into the molecule, this also could be done in bulk. And we can create pseudopods and pull in either just a solution, which would couple all of this to penocytosis. Cytosis followed by transcytosis of that vesicle across to be dumped under the extracellular matrix on the other side of the cell. Or if it's more, more specific, we might use receptor mediated endocytosis. Okay, so we can couple it to diffusion, penocytosis, or receptor mediated endocytosis. These last two, B and C, require the formation of vesicles. And so transcytosis of these molecules becomes that much more extensive experience of taking that vesicle, connecting it up to a motor protein, locking it down the cytoskeleton and across the, the cell, and then depositing it through endocyt uh, exocytosis on the other side. Diffusion across the cell would continue really as diffusion trans. Uh, from a transcytosis perspective across the cell. So through the cell membrane, across the cell, and through the cell membrane on the other side. All right, our last and final mechanism 
is a process known as filtration and reabsorption. Filtration and reabsorption. Now, really, these are two separate mechanisms. Filtration is a mechanism. Reabsorption is a mechanism. We're going to really see these. Um, we'll see. We'll see filtration and reabsorption in a variety of different tissues, but this is the creme de la creme in the kidneys. This is what, the kidneys is where it happens uh, the most pro profoundly. So the filtration is simply a statement of moving plasma to the interstitial fluid or the extracellular fluid or the extracellular matrix or the ground substance. Interstitial, I think I spelled that right. Okay, so filtration would be plasma into the interstitial fluid and then reabsorption. is going to be in the reverse, our extracellular fluid, our interstitial fluid, or intracellular, or extracellular matrix into the plasma. So really, filtration and reabsorption are moving solutes in opposite directions. Filtration, filtering it into the tissue, reabsorption, picking it up back out of the tissue. Now, the, the first two, the transcytosis and the diffusion, I mean, diffusion, we've done a lab on it in, in the past semester. Uh, we've talked about the, the process of setting up a concentration gradient. You're using all of those mechanisms as well. Transcytosis, you're just simply either allowing molecules to diffuse from one side of the cell to the other from a high concentration point towards a low concentration point, or more physically moving the vesicle along using motor proteins and the cytoskeleton. Filtration and reabsorption, this is a lot more intense. There's a lot more going on here to facilitate these processes. So we're going to spend a decent amount of time here. And we're going to use this figure over here. You can see there are a lot of numbers on there. There's a lot of arrows. We're going to try to go through all of them. Good. Okay. So when we look at an arterial, I'm sorry, when we look at a capillary bed, which is what you're looking at here, you're going to have an artery, you're going to have the actual capillary, and then you're going to have the vein or the venule on the other side. So this capillary, we can look at it from an arterial side and a venal side or a vein side. I'm going to start on that arterial side. So on the arterial end of a capillary or a capillary bed, the blood, as it's entering the capillary, is going to have some specific characteristics. One of those characteristics is going to be an elevated hydrostatic pressure. So an elevated hydrostatic pressure. What exactly is this hydrostatic pressure? Well, it's quantified at 30 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so this is just a pressure measurement. And really what the hydrostatic pressure is, is it is the pressure that is exerted by the fluid basically the fluid being the blood. So all fluids exert a pressure. And we could take a pressure transducer and I could put that pressure transducer in Heather's water bottle there or Taylor's whatever it is, coffee drink, and they probably are going to have different pressures. If I have a sensitive enough pressure probe, we could measure the pressure exerted by those fluids and they're probably going to be different. In the case of blood on the arterial side of our circulation into the capillary, the hydrostatic pressure there is roughly about 30 millimeters of mercury. And it's the pressure exerted by the fluid. And normally the way that we model this or the variable that we use is P cap. Just simply is going to be the pressure in the capillary. 
And so you could go over here to this figure and you might find PCAP. Here's PCAP here, here's PCAP over here, and then we actually are going to be able to quantify PCAP on both sides of the arterial. Ar arterial. On this side, the PCAP, they actually put it in there as 38. 30 is another number that I've, um, that I've run into. So over here, they're just saying 38, 30 to 38. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a range. It's not exactly the same number. So just simply PCAP, arterial end of the blood, as the blood enters in here, the pressure that's exerted by the fluid of the blood is going to be about 30 millimeters over. Now, let's get involved here a little bit. Where else do I have fluid besides my capillary? There's a bunch of cells out here, right? And those cells are part of the tissue, so that means there's also extracellular matrix or extracellular fluid. That is also going to be fluid. So there's fluid out here. And guess what? that fluid is also going to be inducing some pressure. So we're going to have our interstitial fluid. And this is actually going to have a lower hydrostatic pressure. I'm just going to abbreviate that HYD press. Now, what's Really interesting here is the hydrostatic pressure of the interstitial fluid. If we really get down to measuring it, that hydrostatic pressure can be quantified as minus three millimeters of mercury. I mean, how crazy is that? We abbreviate that as PIF, so that's going to be the pressure induced by the interstitial fluid. And it's a negative hydrostatic pressure. What the heck does that even mean? Well, it's first of all a relative pressure. We're looking at relative to the whole system. So if we're just to measure that pressure, it's actually going to be a positive pressure. But relative to the whole system, we, we say, oh, it's, it's more of a negative pressure. And the effect is that it sort of acts to pull fluid in. So we have our hydrostatic pressure of 30 over here pushing fluid out. And then in all reality, we also have the interstitial fluid sort of pulling that fluid out as well. So we're pulling fluid into the tissue. And we're pushing fluid out of the blood because of the hydrostatic blush, pressure of blood out of the blood into the, into the tissue. Okay, so a little simple math here, right? We can calculate an arterial net hydrostatic pressure. Okay, arterial net hydrostatic pressure. So it's net. That means that it's just a combination of all of the hydrostatic force on the arterial end of a capillary. So it's this pressure from the interstitial fluid and this pressure here from the capillary, from the blood contained in the capillary. 30 for our PCAP minus 3 for our PIF, our PF. And so when I calculate all of that out, there is a hydrostatic pressure of plus 33 millimeters of mercury. And so what that means is there is enough pressure being pushed out and pulled out to favor the movement of blood or of solution from the blood to the tissue. And this is just because of the presence of water, right? Now, there are actually some additional factors here that are going to influence 
capillary exchange through filtration and reabsorption. We have the hydrostatic pressure in the two different fluids, the capillary blood and then the uh, tissue fluid. We also are going to have what's known as a colloid osmotic pressure. Okay, and these are going to be given the Greek letter pi as the representative variable. Now the colloid osmotic pressure at the onset, let's first say that this just simply is going to oppose the hydrostatic pressure. Okay, so it opposes the hydrostatic pressure. And the reason for the colloid osmotic pressure, hopefully you're recognizing colloid, you know that a colloid is a um, very large particle suspension or solution. So these, uh, it, it, the, the osmotic pressure that's being induced here osmo uh, against osmosis, so the pressure against osmosis is being induced by the fact that blood is a colloid. So what actually accounts for the colloid of blood? Primarily, it's going to be the present presence of proteins that are in the blood and in the intercellular fluid. And because we have those particulates, so if I just sort of draw out a container here, if this is just water, the water is the only thing that's inducing the pressure. But now I begin to add in some pretty sizable particles. And those sizable particles, especially if I cap this off and give it a limited volume, <coughs> which is what we're going to see in both the capillaries and the tissue, our tissues really aren't changing their volume all that readily, right? It's a limited size or a limited capacity for our, for our uh, organs and our tissues. But as I add in additional particles, those particles now begin to consume space that the water, -wise would, other, the water would otherwise consume. And so now I have this additional force that's acting on the water to push on the water and it's going to affect the hydrostatic pressure. So primarily it's proteins. The cells are going to have some effect here as well. But we have proteins that are inducing this osmotic pressure. And what happens here is we now want to balance where we have higher proteins and lower proteins. This becomes really a tonicity question. And we want to balance this out. So because of the presence of the proteins, this causes water to be drawn or driven toward the higher protein location, where I have more protein in my solution. Okay? And we can actually quantify this as well. And when we quantify the effects of the colloid osmotic pressure, if we look at the blood, the blood has a plus 28 millimeter of mercury effect, whereas the tissue is a minus 8 millimeter of mercury effect. So the presence of proteins is higher in the, in the, uh, I'm sorry, is higher in the tissue than it is in the blood. And so the water is going to be drawn to move from the blood into the tissue, which would be plasma, to the interstitial tissue, which would be filtration. So the colloid osmotic pressure is going to favor filtration. Now that's a little bit of a problem, but we're going to get around that problem. And we'll talk about how we do that. But if it's favoring filtration, I am continuously pushing fluid into my tissue. That means I don't have the ability to move that fluid back out of my tissue, at least on the arterial side of the catheter. All right, now if I take both my hydrostatic pressure and my... Um, my hydrostatic pressure and my colloid osmotic pressure, I can use both of those effects to calculate a net 
COP. I'm sorry, let me back up. I got ahead of myself. Uh, first, I'm going to calculate net COP, and then we'll talk about net filtration pressure. The net COP, this just stands for um, the net colloid osmotic pressure. I'm going to refer to that as the oncotic pressure. So oncotic pressure and net colloid osmotic pressure are basically the same thing. I go through and do my calculation here. And my oncotic pressure in the system on the arterial side of the circulation, about 20 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so now let's summarize everything. We're going to get a net filtration pressure under normal physiological circumstances. This just basically indicates that it's filtration, and it's a pressure that drives that filtration based off of net, meaning the hydrostatic pressure and the colloid osmotic pressure. And so my net filtration pressure, I'm just simply going to take my plus 33 hydrostatic pressure from PCAP and PF minus my plus 20 for my net colloid osmotic pressure. And so that gives me a net filtration of plus 13 millimeters of mercury. Now, using the plus sign, that means we're basically using plus to describe pressures in the blood, minus or um, lower numbers to describe the pressure in the, uh, in the tissue. So a plus 13 is going to favor movement from plasma into the tissue. So it's a filtration. So we're going from plasma into the extracellular fluid or the interstitial fluid or ground substance and so on and so forth. So on the arterial side, we have this favor of moving out of, is it like, <laughs> I'm sorry, I, you know I looked at it and I must have read it wrong because I thought it said 1050 or 1046. 1045. Thanks for uh, really 